fussy Zora finally solved the puzzle, but she doesn't feel comfortable telling the crew or captain or really anybody or whatever. Uh, Tarka reminds us that politicians are like Garothian sulfur slugs. That's a tough one. Small brain meat sacks. And uh, Captain Saru brings Tarina a potted plant. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirak Lofton. Hello, hello. I kind of stumbled through that one, but that's okay. My name is Ryan T. Husk, and today we're doing a review of Discovery Season 4, Episode 7, But to Connect, and we are joined by a very special guest, audio engineer, Gull Du Scott. Hello, everyone. Hope everybody's having a good night tonight. Yeah. Uh, all right, well, let's have some fun. This was directed by Lee Rose. I don't recognize that name, but Lee Rose was the director. And this was a fun one. How are you guys doing? Good. Doing good. Hmm. Doing good. Doing well, great. but to connect is the name of this episode. Yeah. But to connect. But to connect. Dot, dot, dot. But to connect. As if it's like the end of a sentence. As in like. We aren't here to destroy, but to connect, or something like that. Oh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. thank you. I put mm-hmm. the dots in the wrong place. I put it after <laughs> to connect the dots. That reminds like, me. Con- <laughs> have you guys seen dots. one of one of the greatest movies ever done, acted, directed, and written? Sling Blade, uh, one of the best ever, in my opinion. Maybe my favorite ever. Uh, there is a line, a, a couple lines in there where the guy is like, you put the dot, dot, dot in the wrong place. The dots are where I say they are. I guess you all don't remember that. But anyway, it reminded me of that when you said that. Uh, uh, all I remember from that movie was French fried. Uh, yeah. Was it fried potatoes? Yeah. I like them French fried potatoes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like them French fried potatoes. So anyway. Mm-hmm. Mm. Best movie ever. <laughs> okay. So this was awesome. Uh, this episode made me look something up. I had to learn something today. And that was what? Experto well, Credita. Credita, I think is how they pronounce it. Experto Credita. And that means to trust. Let me guess. That's when your credit cards expired. Yes. And then your Experion. Uh, <laughs> uh, your rating goes down. It's so <laughs> Yeah, no, it means to no, basically, tr- basically trust the experts. And, you know, that's something that, you know, we all kind of have to remind ourselves of sometimes, especially when you're delegating work or when you think you can do something better than somebody else. Sometimes you should just trust the person that's done it 40 times instead of you who's done it zero times for example. And uh, yeah, there was a moment I, that I tried to trust the experts. They had told me two weeks to stop the spread. It <laughs> didn't work out too well. <laughs> it hasn't been two weeks yet. You just need more patience. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, it was something like that to where uh, when, when Michael Burnham was talking with Kovic and she was like, <laughs> I can do this. I can do this. You got to let me do this. And he said, basically, Hey, I've done this before trust the experts and he trusted the experts later on when he was letting Stamets talk mm-hmm. and Adira talk and all these other people bring in the information. He was, That's, he was absolutely unbelievable in this episode. I'm, COVID? This is the most screen time we got Kovic and David I think so. Yeah. I think this is the most time that he's had, you know, we were just been so worried about him since the beginning of his, he section 31 is he, and he's, He's doing genuine good in this episode. Yeah. So I don't know if that's going to bite us later or not, but when we find out that he's, he's well, Section 31. What, what is his is he what is his title and he is the Section 31 guy? Is that what it is? Well, he's just a doctor. We were wondering. Yeah, he's just a doctor. We were wondering because of his um his uh interactions with the with Mirror uh Georgiou before she disappeared. Uh, he's right. always like, you hey, want to talk and he's not in a uniform and he's got these, these glasses. Why does he have glasses? You know, not a thousand years in the future. And yeah. He's doing, but yeah, he was and him and, um, and Wilson Cruz playing on yeah. each other too. Those two, man. Ooh. Yeah. I was really impressed by him this whole time. Well, I'm looking up Kovic right now to see if there's anything we missed about him. We just know that he's a doctor. That's his rank. That's his official rank in Starfleet. 
So, but he doesn't really seem like a medical doctor. That's for sure. Right. He seems more like, no, like, you know, he's got a doctorate in something, you know, something in the sciences. Yeah. (laughs) Pretty interesting. He's just got such an interesting way. The actor does of delivering things kind of like, uh, Giancarlo Esposito, I think is his name, who was in Breaking Bad, where you just watch, you, you could, there, there's a scene where he's just reading a newspaper, not doing anything. And we're just watching him read a newspaper and it's gripping. I'm just like, <laughs> what? Like, you could literally just watch him for 10 minutes doing nothing. And then, and this guy, Kovic uh, Cronenberg, he's also very interesting to where you can just kind of, Everything he says is just in a weird way. It makes it, it makes, it just adds something to it. And I can't quite put my finger on it. And looks like we have not gotten any information as to what he actually does. So maybe that's why. Yeah. Every time I see him, I think the same thing and I can't, it just doesn't go away. I think of the movie, The Matrix. Mm. And I, and I think of the guys that were, chasing uh keanu reeves neo down uh, you know those... agent smith agent smith agent smith, smith. yes mr anderson yeah. mr anderson <laughs> uh yeah every time i see him i think of agent smith and he's got basically he could have easily have played that part in my opinion the agent Interesting. Smith part because that's the that's the way he delivers his lines and which makes him like mysterious and like, you don't know who, you know, what he's really getting at. Like agent Smith, I wasn't sure whose side he was on. What I mean, I knew he was on the bad side, but just the way he talked made it look like he was mysterious essentially. And that's how I feel about Govich's character. It's really interesting. Uh, Cause I always think of him as Elrond. So that's it, you know, like uh, he's Elrond in, in Lord of the Rings. His full name is Elrond Hubbard. Uh, but anyway. yeah, I thought you were going to say that. That was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Elrond. Yeah, that's, that's only Elrond I know. <laughs> okay, but there's a Lord of the Rings Elrond. Right, okay. right. And uh, I can't remember the actor's name. What's his name, uh, Scott? Oh. Uh, that plays Agent Smith and Elrond. It and, is. Um, is in V for Vendetta as well, wasn't he? I don't know. Is that. that the same? He had the mask on the whole time and still acted the hell out of it. Hmm. Really? Absolutely. That was him? Yeah. I believe it. I, I, uh, Hugo Weaving? Yes. Got it. Thank yes. goodness. Yes. Yeah, there it is. I could hear all yeah. the nerds screaming in my ear right now. Yeah, I yeah. hope I was trying to get it come out. It's Hugo Weaving. what? Weaving. Hugo Weaving. Oh, yeah. I yeah. See it. Okay. So one one thing that made me really excited was when they said, we're going to have delegates or ambassador or representatives, I think it was, from all four quadrants. Right. And our first thought is, down, yeah. is, all right, we get to see all kinds of aliens. Like we, mm-hmm. we knew there was a big alien scene coming up there and they did not disappoint. There were some we recognized, some we didn't. There was one guy that was just wearing like a white jacket or something. And we're like, come on, that's, is that an alien or is that a guy skiing? Yeah, I wrote down that guy. I was like, nice He's outfit. <laughs> yeah. But all He's, the other things were like pretty awesome. He thought like it was a rave. Guy. He, yeah. he just showed up because he was told it was a rave and he wore his white. He just it turned out, out it was a boat. It's like, <laughs> oh, we got a boat? Oh, man. <laughs> but we saw a, a, a full Cardassian lady, like not a hybrid. We there's uh, There was an Andorian. There were some Vulcans and Romulans. Lots of good stuff. Some we didn't recognize too, right? Oh, there was also The Ferengi guy was there. Mm-hmm. The Ferengi guy was there. Yeah. He was back. Really? And you know when I see those scenes, I don't know about you, but I always think about the makeup on that day. I'm like, did yeah. they have all of these guys in at the same time? And mm-hmm. must have been a makeup uh, <laughs> makeup nightmare to have all the aliens working on the same day. It's a parking lot just full of trailers. Just <laughs> yeah, right. at once. We only got four hours, guys. Everybody in here at once. I was also thinking logistically with COVID. They're like, we need to have a scene where we have like at least 20 different delegates from all these things, but we're trying to keep people apart. And they're, they're probably, that's probably why they decided to have them all spaced out in a circle mm-hmm. rather than like together, you know, they just got creative with it. They said, okay, well, how do we, how do we do? And then they had them on different levels too. So yep. really mm-hmm. like a smart way to do it. That still made it look 
interesting, but I would guess that COVID had something to do with that creativity. Because it definitely felt like that room was full. So that was very cool how they would have worked mm -hmm. around. And I don't know if that was animated in all those different levels. Because, you know, you had like three or four people on each one of the levels and the four sides. Interesting. So I don't know if that was CG'd in afterwards in post or something like that. But yeah, it definitely gave the feel of a film. I mean, it made me forget when it was filmed, for sure. You know, oh, right. Yeah, I didn't think COVID when I was watching it. I didn't think that the, of the restrictions and the kind of difficulty they ran into while filming. I couldn't sense that by watching the episode. Yep. It did feel full. Um, you know, and, and like you said, I don't know how they pieced everybody together on that voting section. Um, but it did it did come together seamlessly. What were you going to say, you? Ryan? I was, was going to say... I don't know, a bunch of stupid stuff, I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, I will say that Dr. Colbert today, for the first time, was actually starting to remind me a little bit of Jordy LaForge in, in his delivery. I don't remember what it was in his mannerisms, but I've mentioned before, you know, how I think Jordy uh, LeVar Burton so far out of everybody in Star Trek ever was the best at delivering techno babble, trekno babble, you know, where he made it feel effortless. But beyond that, he had a delivery, you know, that was very, very genuine and very soothing to the watcher. Like we always felt, at least my own experience, I felt comfortable watching Jordy. Like he seemed nice. He seemed thoughtful and he would think things through and, and acted out a lot in his mouth and in his eyebrows because you couldn't see his eyes, but there was just something there. And I saw that in Colbert this week. And I was like, oh, that it just kind of reminded me of Jordy there. And, and I'm not really 100% sure what it was. I think it was just the genuine delivery and the kind of like the thoughtfulness behind the words. I don't know if you guys have, have caught that at all, but there's a little something there and that's great company to be in because Culver's one of my favorites on this show and Jordy is one of the best ever in my opinion. Yeah, I didn't catch the moment. Uh, I wasn't reminded of Jordy um, watching this episode. The, the things that kind of caught my eye was this, this uh, black woman that played the general and Doye. Yeah. Ndoye, is that her name? Yeah, N-D-O-Y-E, I think. Yeah, we've General. seen her before. <laughs> was it at the end of last season, Scott? Well, I think it was It was when we had the whole, uh, the Earth conflict. Yeah, maybe it, maybe it was the beginning of last season. Maybe it was the beginning of the I think it was early. Season. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was right when they found Starfleet and they finally found the shipyard and everything. And, Mm -hmm. Oh, wait, Earth isn't in the Federation anymore. <laughs> and now they're including Titan. Right. Titan has Dave United already. And I love how they gave what? Michael that that up, too. She's like, because of your example, we've decided to to unify with Titan mm -hmm. and come in as one voice. Mm -hmm. Well, what's Titan, guys? I missed that. I missed it's the a, Titan part. It's a, a moon. It, it's a Ju one of Jupiter's Jupiter? moon. It's either Saturn or Jupiter. And those are the guys that are hogging up all the moons okay. in our, in our yeah. galaxy. Uh I think okay. it might be tight. It's either yeah, Saturn or Jupiter. They were, they were, it was a mining colony that was set off from Earth. And then when the burn happened, you know, it was a lot harder to get back. So they kind of had made their own world and their own culture out there on that, on Titan itself. Really interesting. And, and eventually separated from Earth. And now they're, they're kind of reunifying again. Yeah. So this general Andoya okay, is a little they, bit they more are militant. humans, right? Yeah. Yeah. They're all human. But yeah, yeah, so Sorok, you okay. noticed her. She's a little bit more militant. Um, the actress plays it well. We saw her, I think, maybe two episodes in the third season, something like that. Yeah, I didn't remember that much from before, but she did have a lot of presence in this episode. Yeah, uh, yeah I felt her. Uh, I felt her being there. I also felt, I uh, also like the guy that they brought in to go opposite book in those scenes that we've seen before. Parka. Well, Man. Parker. Grand Moff Tarka is pretty Ooh. badass, isn't he? I like that guy. I think he's a good actor. And, you know, we're going to see where, where it takes us. I think there's something nefarious about him. Because he, I don't know, he's, he's kind of been inserted really quickly. Like, yeah. first he was like, oh, he's, he's the boy genius that's going to figure all this out. 
And then all of a sudden he's got a, like a mini spore drive in his, is that a spore drive in your pocket? Or you just have, oh, hey, zip, <laughs> <zing>. <laughs> <Boom>. <laughs> and, uh, so yeah, he pulls down spore drives. I, I don't know where his purpose is. I don't know what is going to be the end result for his destination, but whatever it is, I'm, I'm kind of curious to see where he's going to take us. I do like the way he plays his character. There is a mystery behind him. There's also a confidence to him where he feels like you get the sense that like he knows just a little bit more than the person he's talking to about the situation. Right. Yeah. I mean, my prediction, and we hate making predictions here, but it feels like uh, it feels like eventually book is going to have a change of heart. And he's going to say, whoa, wait a second. This is just too much. I can't do it. There's going to be something. Either he's going to see something in Tarka or there's going to be some new piece of information that Michael reveals to him, for example. But then there's going to be a struggle between Book and Tarka, right? And there's going to be like maybe it's a physical battle or a battle of the wits or whatever. And then Book is going to win, thank goodness. Oh, yeah. And then Michael will Good be drama. right to have... You know, and Book will realize that Michael was right, and then all will be good in the galaxy again. But I want to ask you guys, whose side were you rooting for in the vote? Book or Michael? I was on Book's side for the vote. And I was like, look, this thing, whatever it is, it's it's destroying planets. It's yeah. It's threatening galaxies. It's, it's, there's no cure for it. And I'm thinking that it's, it's caused or created for a malevolent purpose. And it's, it, it's not there to do any kind of good. So whoever created it um, must not have any good intentions in, in their, in them themselves so i don't know part part of me is thinking destroy and, and agreeing with book now i had certain conflicts to that as i was watching the episode because you know and i don't understand the dma the dmt the nwa or dmx <laughs> on this episode you understand but, the nwa <laughs> well nwa i understand yeah we got that part. but and scott <laughs> understands the dmt <laughs> the D- <laughs> so they so they go dma dmt all that stuff and you know it's, it's hard for me to really because we had the burn before this now we've got this dma thing or whatever that's you know another threat to the world the galaxy but Essentially, I, I, I don't know. It's just I, I have a problem kind of wrapping my head around it, um, the science behind it, the reason behind it. But as I was watching the episode, I was thinking, was this thing caused by their own existence? Was this thing caused by the jump that they made a thousand years into the future? Interesting. And did that, did that rip space-time fabric? Da, da 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 and cause this dma thing and so then they themselves would be responsible for it then i would say no don't kill the source of it you know yeah. because it didn't Blow yourself you up. are the source <laughs> so it'll be the damn michael accident yep. <laughs> so those are those are, that was kind of one of my dma like oh maybe they're the origin of it you know and uh that could tie back into that so I, I don't know, because because I don't know the origin, I guess it, it makes more sense to figure that out first and then decide whether you want to take it out or not. Scott, were you you were on Michael's side, I bet, because I, it, well, it feels like in in kind of the real world, look, in the real world, if there's something that's destroying worlds or let's just say destroying homes or countries or whatever, we're going to do everything we can to stop it as quickly as possible because if we don't, that's negligence. We, you know, not acting to save lives is almost as bad as killing them yourself. So, yes, of course, we would stop it at all costs and ask, shoot first and ask questions later. We would have to, otherwise, more innocent lives will be lost. And Book is saying, like, hey, 
I lost my entire plan. Maybe to you guys, you can act all like high and mighty about it. Yeah. I just lost. You haven't lost Everything. your entire plan. It's easy for you to say, well, like, let's let's talk about this. Let's take our time now. Mm -hmm. Now, don't be so hasty, little hobbits, you know, but he's like, dude, we need to if you lose your entire planet, you're going to wish that you had acted sooner. Now, that's the real world. In the Star Trek universe, if I know Star Trek, there will be a lesson that has to do with, you know, oh, it turned out that it was a life form that was just accidentally killing them. And then, you know, you can't, you can't kill one thing to save another, you know, and there's going to be some kind of moral dilemma that we used to see a lot, say, like a Next Generation or maybe the original series. But I don't know. Scott, what do you think? Were you on oh, well, Team it, Michael there? It's uh, my, my head is 100 percent with with the Federation and with Michael on there. And but like you were saying, I, I don't know what it's like to have my entire planet blown up. And <laughs> or, yeah, yeah, thankfully for all of us. Thankfully, yeah, thank yeah, thank goodness. But, um, so, <laughs> I th but I also thought that it was very interesting where book was finally looked at Tarker and he's like, well, what's your horse in this race? Why are you so other than just, you know, being a hot shot and wanting to figure this out and everybody. And then I, 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 I see his face and I can't stand Tarka. I, I, I can't stand him. It's a testament to his acting ability and to the way that the character is being written and to have a Ryson as well. Yeah, being put into that role, and uh, then he gives the backstory that he gave about his his friend and being trapped in the in the Emerald Chain and being forced to do this research, and then just drop this whole yes, there are alternate realities other than the mirror universe that just exist everywhere. So talk about opening up some storytelling there because you can do a Star yes. Trek story in any universe and it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And then it, it turns out that. While I understand his motive to wanting to get to this, you know, war-free, perfect world, it is kind of a selfish thing that, you know, oh, well, it, it, it turns out it's cool that I'm trying to, you know, rip the engine out of this giant killing device, but I want it for myself so I can go and, you know, run off with it and do what I think is right to use its power source. So mm -hmm. it's kind of a two-sided thing there. But, um, yeah, I definitely when it came down to it, I would have had to have raised my hand with Michael to be a little bit more careful going into this situation because also, I mean, Tarka is a smart dude, but what happens if you're going in there with this device makes it worse. And mm -hmm. like she was saying, you can't that entire sector, no more warp in that sector because you screwed up. They, they wasn't that in, in TNG where they had talked about that technology and how you can't use it because of the, the dire Oh, Reasons see, I didn't recognize that. It felt like it was a reference to something that we had seen before, but sometimes they do those things and we think it's a reference, but we don't remember it. <laughs> so I don't remember. This felt like another one of those things where yeah. they were alluding to a specific episode that we have seen before. And they did mention the Kittimer Accords, which had been yeah. mentioned a bunch of times in Next Generation as well. So it's entirely possible. Everybody that's listening in, let us know in the comments. Tell us. Is that from a specific episode? And if so, which one? Um, I also want to point out, still talking about this dilemma of the back and forth. Um, you know, it looked like it was about 60-40 in that vote. But I kind of felt like when, when we saw the two arguments and uh, Michael was on that specific side, my first thought was, that's the side that Captain Picard would choose, right? Because we've seen him do that. And then I thought, but Cisco would be on book side. And then I thought Janeway would be on book side. Archer would be on uh, Michael's side, right? At, at least from everything that we've seen, I feel like Janeway and Cisco were the ones that were willing to kind of do a the darker deed for the greater good. Whereas Archer and uh Picard were always trying to be flawless which was kind of a flaw in and of itself where they were trying to not do the bad thing for the greater good except for when Archer left those guys stranded with without engines but we'll leave that alone but then the question then became where does Kirk fall on this I feel like Kirk would feels, choose a yeah. third option and just blow everything up <laughs> what would Kirk do yes. <laughs> he goes back in time by flying around a, a planet 
yeah, that's shots Superman. back in time <laughs> and makes none of it ever happen in the first place and then creates another reality and then you can put more movies out. So, so yeah. everybody that's listening in here, what side do you think Kirk would be on? Because that's the one that baffled me. Scott, you probably know the original series better than we do. What do you think? Where would Kirk lean in this? I, I think there would be a full-on battle for a full episode with him having Spock with and like McCoy. He did rip his, his shirt off. Yeah, and, and just <laughs> for some reason it automatically rips down. But you'll you'll have Spock obviously on the side of Michael. I think you'll have Bones obviously on the side of well, we need to go out here and you shoot that he's from Georgia. He's gonna blow the thing up. It's <laughs> it's automatic. Yeah. So and then he would have to weigh it. And then I think by the end of it though, I think uh I think original Shatner Kirk. Now, if we're talking Kelvin, it could be completely different. Right. Is, is raising and, and you know alternate realities once again. But I think Kirk would would come in on the side of Michael by the end of it. OG okay. Shatner Kirk. Yeah. I think it would it would be a long haul, but I think he'd make it on that side. That's just such an interesting and, and very Star Trek kind of dilemma. I mean that part of this was I feel like we've seen Picard lecture us like 20 times about we shall not lose what makes us, what binds us as Federation or what, you know, whatever he says when he gets all hot. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I just thought uh, that was very my answer right. to that really quickly is that I think it would be a, the, what you said initially, which is a third option. I think Kirk would opt to do something completely off script. And I don't even <laughs> think he would stick around for a vote. Yeah. He, he, he wouldn't, he wouldn't participate in a vote. I think he'd just be like, all right, you guys vote. And, I'm going to go over here and do what the hell They'd is be like, where yeah. did Kirk go? And where'd that Orion slave girl go? <laughs> Where's she going? I couldn't imagine Kirk with yeah. a personal transporter. He Nobody would back ever know where he's like, Are you guys <laughs> done with that boat yet? There's green all over his face. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's my bet right there. I got money on Orion. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, she says, I, I like to change my vote too, whatever he says. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we you know there were some good moments here in this episode i thought the real good moment was between book and uh tarka yeah Again. when another good moment between them when book is kind of like yeah um you know I, I got rid of my tattoo or whatever that thing is in the back of uh tarka's neck Sorry. and uh Tarka looks over to him and he says, you know, he points kind of at his pendant on his necklace. And he's like, yeah, we all, we, you know, we hold on to grief in our own ways. I thought it was a good line and a good moment between the two of them. It was that little moment and the way it was acted. Uh, I thought it was well written and well performed. Mm -hmm. Which is also important. That's a great point. It's also important for them to, keep making these connections from a writing point of view, because that's going to make it harder for Booker to make his decision. If in fact, in future episodes, he will have to make a decision. You know, I'm just guessing here, but if in fact they do end up disagreeing and, ha and Booker has to do something about that, it's going to make it a lot harder when it's not uh, like a one dimensional character, when it's a character that he actually understands and identifies with in a way and Tarka in many ways is the only character that that understands Booker in, in some of the ways you know like he he can talk to him on a level that nobody else has spoken to him uh and right now Booker's like looking at Michael like man she's just a nag lately like he's yeah. you know, like, <laughs> like there was a really her. beautiful moment between <laughs> those two where there was that subtext I don't remember what the line was, but basically when Booker was saying, you know, sometimes we have to realize that there's a, a problem here and it's maybe not worth trying to fix or something like that. And he was looking at Michael and she gave a beautiful, the actress Sonequa gave a, a beautiful reaction without any words where she just kind of like looked and there was like a realization like, hey, what the are you trying to say? What are you, you know, she like shock and, and hurt and anger all, all wrapped into one very good nonverbal communication between those two i agree mm. very good um and yeah you know this is um this is setting book on the course to being back what i like him as which is the yeah. badass individual on solo type of you know i i do my own thing and i like that so we're getting him back on the right course he seems to be this is let him grieve by 
with actions as opposed to just with words and emotions and stuff. Um, so I like the fact that he's taking action. And we've also seen that him and Burnham have been having these kind of spats lately. You remember they went a couple of episodes ago to go rescue those prisoners from the planet. Oh, yeah. It was about to be destroyed. And when they came back and they left the one guy back, Book was not happy with her. He, he gave her the look and walked out like, you're, like, I'm disappointed in you. And like me and you, we're not on the same wavelength. We're not vibing anymore. And I see more of that deterioration in their relationship in this moment as well, where they're like, he's like, I don't, you know, we're not on that same page anymore. We used to be on the page. We saw things the same. Right. Now I'm seeing you kind of wander off. And I'm wonder. I'm going to world wander over here in my own direction. Totally, too, and so. that again is just going to add to the difficulty of Book's decision, because right now he's got this dude that's his friend and that he's identifying with, and he's got his girlfriend that he's kind of pulling away from. And there's going to be a point where he's going to have to maybe flip flop against, you know, his emotions, his current emotions. Just going to make that decision that much harder. Uh, but they may still end up saying, Hey, that was great. High five, but let's still break up. What do you think, Scott? <laughs> do you foresee the demise of their relationship? I don't know. He left, he left grudge with her. So, and the little, I love you take care of yeah. her. Notes. Right. So I don't, yeah. I don't know if he's planning on coming back at all. I think that he thinks this is a one-way shot. You're and so he, right. I mean, he loves grudge and that when you don't have your home world anymore, I would assume that every last tiny thing that you have from that life would be incredibly important. So the fact that he leaves grudge just sitting on her bed and, you know, they had the talk earlier about how she's warming up to you because she doesn't want to, you know, kill you anymore. It's totally cats. A hundred percent. What cats are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, and oh, soon it'll be, what is it? Uh, some kind of indifference. It was, it was hilarious. Great, great interchange in the beginning, but. Do you I, don't, think Michael, I don't think he's thinking too hard. Yeah. Do you think Michael is going to be a good caretaker for the cat? Like a good grudge match? <laughs> she she could hold a grudge, I guess. So <laughs> okay. Like that. Yours is better. Yours is better. <laughs> no, God. Yours is better. Hopefully she can, because that cat is that cat is majestic. So hopefully somebody can take care of that cat. But yeah, but that is a sign to me that you know. Uh, opposite of Cisco leaving his baseball, you know, because Cisco was coming mm. back, right? Uh, and I don't know if this he doesn't. He's he's mentioned many times about how oh, where's Grudge? Grudge is secure. Like him and Hologram Stamets going out earlier on is like oh, Grudge is secure. Or uh, we have the Queen back when they were talking to the butterfly bug folk. You know, like how oh, the Queen was back. He was there. So, so was Scott, was Scott, there. You, you don't think he's coming back? Is that what you're saying? I think that he is but, preparing emotionally that he's not yeah. coming back from this mission. It's going to kill him. I think that, that he is, he's, he's prepared that he's not going to come back from this and that this is a one way trip and he's willing to make that sacrifice to, I, I don't think in his head it's to avenge his planet. I think that to book, I think he is this good of a person that this isn't about vengeance. This right. is about stopping anyone else from feeling what he feels. See, I don't think he's trying to one up or you know even the score. I think he's trying to prevent this from ever happening to anybody else, which yeah. is testament to who he is, just as a as a, a person or Quajonian or whatever. Yeah, Quajonian. Quajon. Well, they say that's a really good point because they say that the people that have suffered the most pain in life and such great pain also end up being the ones that are most empathetic to others pain. So this kind of thing, and he's already empathic. We already know that he's very well connected emotionally to other people and other animals. And so the fact that he's gone through so much pain, he's probably thinking like, Hey, you guys don't understand how much pain is in your future. And I'm willing to do whatever it takes to make sure nobody suffers as much as I have. And I think you're right that in his mind, he's thinking I may not be coming back. And that's why he's leaving grudge who he always takes with him. The fact that he's leaving grudge is probably the the hint that he believes he may not be coming back. Yeah. Good point. Really hope yeah. he does come back though. I definitely a hundred percent. He will. <laughs> well, maybe not. And, maybe. and how cool was that uh, cat box for uh, oh, grudge? Little golden glass 
Yeah. Only the best for the queen. That's it. Yeah. Only the best, right? The kitty carrier. Yeah. And the awesome, like, like hologram cat toy, which is mm-hmm. great because cats are just notorious for shredding those things like every week. You can't shred up this hologram cat. Nope. Just make it disappear. <laughs> and how, how, how nice was that uh, for Saru to bring succulent gel Ooh. to Terrain? Mm-hmm. Mm. I'll tell you, man, Saru mm. just, he, mm. he pulled it ah. off at the end of that. He made a Vulcan smirk. She yeah, like, mm, yeah, she did. Thank you, Captain. Yeah. She shivered. <laughs> she shivered because he said, he was like, I got something that reminded me of you, succulent. <laughs> oh, what is it? What is it, Captain? She quivered. She was like, oh. <laughs> so great. Thank you, Saru. Yeah, so <laughs> some we heard Anne Marie cheer from thousands of miles away. Everywhere. All of us. Yeah. Yes, we just heard her. Oh, yes. I'd be lying if I said I didn't watch it three times. I did. <laughs> because they were like That's little high school. They were like, they were like little 12 year olds where he's like, Do you I like you? Do you like me? And she's like, hee hee. No, uh, yeah. Well, he's walking there. He's got it in his hand, and she's like, you know, he doesn't say anything. She's like, "What's that in your hand?" She had to. Oh, this. Oh, well. Uh, Hello, President Dorina. Oh, this is. Oh, it's uh, just some. You know, it's just a little. You know, just uh, some KY jelly that I brought. Whoop! Hey, is this thing on? There we go. Hello. (laughs) Um. (laughs) Yeah, you know, Zora the computer. Like I don't know, man. Her name should place. be Snora, if you know what I'm saying. No, I'm just <laughs> Zora the Explorer. Yeah. <laughs> no, nah, she's, yeah. uh, she's getting a little sassy. She was like, oh, I know the she's answer. She's getting sassy. And then she's like, but I yeah. don't feel like telling you guys. I don't trust you with that kind of excuse me, Zora. Excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> well, what was a little I scary about that? I thought was a little creepy about that as well is that she's like, I'm withholding this for information to protect you. And that sounded very section 31 ish too, which mm-hmm. is the origins of Zora is from good point control and all that. And it was like, uh, Oh yeah. Well, I, I know what's best and I'm going to withhold this information and shroud this to keep you safe because I, I have a better uh, moral high ground on that. And I thought that was pretty, yeah. I didn't think about that. till later on when they had said, you know, the sport, the, the, the data from the sphere and, you know, her inception pretty much coming through. Now I tell you what, the, the, the day that my elect, my, what, whatever those things, those uh, autonomous vacuum cleaner tells me that it doesn't feel like turning on at 2 PM on a Tuesday <laughs> because it's afraid I'm going to trip on it is the day that I throw that thing away. I don't go like, okay, well, Sky let me net, make man. you part of the They're team then. <laughs> then. <laughs> yeah. Let me, We're going to send you to Starfleet would Academy. You like? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She's gonna Can get I put a, your name on the mailbox? Would that make you feel better? Like you live here, like you're part of what's going on. <laughs> well, court yeah, you you yeah. yeah. She'll be down a waste yeah, extraction. Uh, yeah. It's called the power button. I'm gonna have to turn that <laughs> power button off and reboot you. Um yeah, I just uh, I have a problem with it a little bit. Just the fact that you know this computer is like showing them pictures of them when they were walking down the thing and like i'm like what kind of what kind of weirdo computer was this like what other pictures do you have do you have me like trying to squeeze one out or when i was in the shower or i don't know like what other what other she, memories are you holding she's on to, sitting Zora? in a tree with the binoculars <laughs> yeah well it's even creepier because yeah, exactly. it was dreams too it was her dreaming all of that so yeah. she was recalling all of it. So it's like a double. I recorded it and I dreamed about it as well. So yeah, you guys, Zora's just a romantic. Let's cut her some slack. She just wants well, people, to, everybody, to love each other. And oh, it was really interesting when they said, "What's your core function?" And she said, "To protect the crew of the Discovery." And they're like, "That is not your program." And they, who did that? <laughs> and she's like, "I program programmed that myself." That that's a red flag, dude. When, <laughs> I mean, it's a sweet one. It's very sweet. It's it's the best possible way, but it's not the the hologram doctor like teach himself how to sing opera. It's right. a completely yeah. It's 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 much a grander scale, you know. And we also had seven years of the doctor becoming what he became as well. And Zora has been like, what is it? Seven episodes, and suddenly you know she's got a name. And but we remember the short trek. That's that even Calypso. further in the future, where she's been abandoned, and she like you said, playing romantic movies and. And making a hologram of herself to dance with um, 
I don't remember the character's name right now, but yeah, definitely. Um, I, I like I like the statement that they had made by the end of it, how when she finally said, uh, "It feels marvelous being seen." I thought that that was a real important thing is that she had been dismissed yeah. and dismissed. And then um, was, I keep saying Cronenberg, but his character's name, how he had. He, Kovich. Yeah. Kovich is he's like, nah, guys, I was here to test you as much as I was here to test them. And uh, a little, little bit of measure of a man in that as well from, from TNG. I feel like there was a little bit of the, where do you draw the line with what is AI and what is a new life form? You know, the first show seeking out new life and new civilizations, right. you know, you know, uh, that reminds me, I just was checking what our buddy Don Crandall sent us. And he does remind us of something that that you're talking about. Uh, first of all, he says uh, this is the second Cardassian we've seen in new Star Trek. We mentioned her uh, Morn species. Alurian was there. That's right. That was another one of the aliens we saw there. Reminds me of the Gal- Galactic Senate in Star Wars, of course. Aurelio, Kenneth Mitchell's character, was mentioned. He created that tiny spore drive. Very interesting. Love Kenneth Mitchell. And that was great. A uh, couple episodes in the final uh, final two episodes of the third season. Um, he looked up isolytic weapons. Uh, the isolytic burst was what Riker used to defeat the Sona in Star Trek Insurrection in the Briar Patch. Okay, that's close. Oh, Okay. Um, it's also popular. It's a popular tactic in a Star Trek card game. Thank goodness for that. Oh, and he that says, yeah. someone said they will call the Riker maneuver. Uh, Zora. Okay. This is, in, this is important here. This is why it reminded us of next generation Zora's sentience and freedom to choose was discovery's own version of next generation's classic, the measure of a man. Uh, one of the best written by, uh, Melinda Snodgrass, if I remember correctly. And its sequel, Quality of Life, about the exocomps. Exocomps, of course, that's definitely one that, you know, where where we're trying to figure out if this new sentient life should be treated as a robot or as a person um, with rights. Uh, Kill a monster first or approach it in a more civilized Star Trekian manner goes all the way back to the original series episode, The Devil in the Dark, with the famous Horta episode. Wow, great knowledge. That's right. First mind meld. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway. First first mind meld. Yeah, that's a really, really good point. Good one. So we've got a couple minutes left. Any final thoughts, guys? Uh yeah, I have a few a few thoughts. Uh I was gonna say something about the hand raising little technology that they did when they did do the vote. I thought it was cool that when they raised their hand, they kind of did this digital, you know, vote for them. Just a little bit of, I mean, it's a minor thing, but it just shows you some, some advancement in technology that I like to see when I watch Star Trek. Right. Those like when they, when they dropped that, that spore drive onto the console and it just kind of assimilated into it. That was really cool. I thought that was a good way to I like that. Yeah. A creative way to show future technology. Um, and then, you know, um, Zora being classified as a new life form uh, is a little bit, I, I gotta, I gotta figure that one out <laughs> because, uh, well, she's going to be very disappointed in you, Sirac. Yeah. Feelings. I just, it's just, she's got feelings, but, uh, we, I guess, I guess we have to define what life is exactly. And that makes exactly life it. life. So that's that's going to be difficult for me, but that's uh, a measure of a man, right? And um, I don't know. Uh, we talked a little bit about Kovic's glasses. <laughs> I, I just seems like it just seems like it's not futuristic enough for me. It's like exactly. they're too. They you want them to look like, like Elton John glasses, huh? <laughs> something, something. Some lasers on the side or something. Woo, yeah. Lasers yeah. or. <laughs> like a hologram that projects in front of it or something. I, I don't know. It just seems, they just seem too dated to me. And uh, I can't get my head around it every time I see them. Like, dude, where, where'd you get yeah. those glasses at the, you know, like they look like you can go buy them right now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, we have Gray going to the Trill home world. So they kind of going to give us, give Gray a little break for a minute and let her, uh, let them, you know, find themselves 
uh, on the Trill planet. Um, Stir the pools. But I do have one other thing, and I wish they, there's, you know, they've got to get rid of this. It's funny because they said 147 original points. Zora was saying, how many points right. are possible for the starting of this DMA? And, and Zora said 147. I thought 47. Oh, right. right. When I heard that. I was like, I was like, ah, here goes the 47 number. That's there. another 47. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. So, um, but the thing that bothers me the most, really, and I, it's a small fix, but I, I just want them to address it a little bit. They got to, they've got to stay away from using so many aphorisms in this show. And I, I started to write them down, and there was just too many to even write down. But these are the kinds of things that I hear in this dialogue. We're all in this together. We cannot let fear define us. We need to decide who we want to be. I hope we can move forward as a united front. Sometimes we have to accept the consequence. Like all of these like generality. You know, I felt like you were Political. reading yep. uh, senior yearbook <laughs> quotes right just now. <laughs> like, that's what I thought you were doing. Yeah. It felt like you were have just reading summer. senior yearbook quotes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like, come on with the dialogue, guys. I mean, seriously. Uh, <laughs> it's not even how people talk to each other. Like, you know, we, nobody's in a conversation and says, yeah, we, we cannot let fear define us. Like, who says that? Like, if you're going to say it in the, in, the, in the middle of a conversation, you kind of say it a little, you say it differently, I, I, you know. The, well, Sirak, you, you and I, I must know. learn to dispel these. Uh, see, <laughs> yes, I can't even yes. do it. <laughs> yeah, you see, we must learn to speak in aphorisms. You and, you and I must make a pact. We must bring salvation. Yeah, back. I'm just. I was waiting for Whitney Houston to come on and say, "I believe the children are the future," and she's right. <laughs> Literally, yes. I mean, these are there's, there's, there's these really <laughs> general kind of sayings that I feel like every single character says, and maybe if it came from just like Saru, I would I could deal with it. But it feels like everybody's saying, you know, when things are tough, you have to, you know, these kind of general, like, blanket statements instead of talking directly to somebody. I'll see, Scott, you're all right? You feeling yeah. good? Uh, <laughs> you know, I know I know things are, I know you're down right now, but, you know, things will get better. And you just got to look at it like this, you know, whatever's <laughs> behind you, you know, put it behind you. Like, more of a casual conversation dialogue not in these like confucius mm. fortune cookie uh phrases like well, a poster on the wall with the cat hanging just yeah. hang in there that kind of thing it's a little too <laughs> yeah. too polished and i mean maybe yeah. maybe a politician using it in a speech right there is what tarka was saying about them all just being you know slugworms or whatever the hell that was but yeah, <laughs> yeah. right <laughs> And maybe right. the, having it's that a, be an illustration of insincerity. Because you're not slug. taking the time to communicate with somebody. It's mm -hmm. insincerity. Yeah. Glossing over. It's, it's too general. There's generalities, you know. We should all have strength when times in moments of weaknesses. Well, of we should, yeah. you know. Like, like <laughs> duh. Like, you know. Like. <laughs> it's, it's, you know what it is? Is it's, uh, it's those fortune cookie fortunes. That's what it is. Yeah, so that's what it is. But you know who does like, have some real conversations is Culber and Stamets. Uh, all the conversations between them are just the realist of the real, it seems, you know. And yeah, maybe more of that would be great. <laughs> maybe yeah, more maybe we're thirsty for more of that realness. Um, well, we do yeah. have to run. Uh, it seems like there's a lot more to talk about in this episode, so we're going to have to uh, finish the conversation in the comments and on social media. Lots of really good stuff. Uh, Goldu Scott, thank you very much for joining the fun with yes. us. It's been Wonderful. awesome. Uh, lots of uh, non-appearance mentions. Guardian Z, Vance, and Aurelio. Voyager 2, if we count a, a ship as a non-appearance mention. But Voyager was mentioned. That was yeah. also pretty cool. Anyway, yeah. thank you all very much for joining us. We also want to give a very special thanks. You know where I'm going with this one. To Carmen, Carmen, a.k.a. Skillet, TJ Jackson Bay out in Missouri, Bill Victor Arukin, Arukin. Yvette Blackman, Tom, Homer Freezy out somewhere in New Yeezy, Eve England out in Wales, Dr. Anne-Marie Siegel, Titus Muller, Tim Baum, John Mann, Darlena Marie, Rex, 
Sean A. Wood, Dr. Muhammad Noor, Joe Balserati, Tierney C. Deacon, and of course, the lovely Dr. Susan V. Gruner. We will see you all very soon. And until next time, always remember that their seventh rule. <laughs>